Okay, well, I think it's 11.20, so I think we'll go ahead and get started with our next speaker. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lorraine McElhern, and I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at UC San Diego. And I am so pleased to have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Ellen Beck. Um, you may have heard of her before because she is quite well known for being um, the co-founder and director of the UCSD Student Run Free Clinic Project. And she's also the director of a national faculty development program about addressing the needs of the underserved and um, oversees a fellowship in underserved health care, which she helped develop. Um, and all of these programs are just um, an incredible gift to UC San Diego that have been going on for um, many, many years. Ellen Beck is also a family and integrative medicine physician, and she practices a mind-body-spirit approach to really help create an environment where a person can take charge of their health and achieve joy and well-being. Um, with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce um, Dr. Beck. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with you this morning. It's odd for me to be this high, so I am going to come down for a few minutes, and if you can't see me, I'll go back up, all right? I just know, you know, after the physical therapy, we don't really want to strain our necks to look up there. Um, anyway, hi, I'm Ellen Beck, and I'm a family doctor. I'm here at UCSD. As Lore said, I, um, I have been here for many years and run the students' courses in family medicine. I run free, the free clinics, which have an empowerment model and a humanistic empowerment model. We're trying at the same time that we provide really free, high-quality healthcare to people who are, have no access to care. But at the same time, we're doing our darndest to inspire the next generation of healthcare professionals, and especially physicians, to be humanistic in their practice, to be respectful and empowering and see the patient and the community as their teacher. And we teach them that and model them that for years. And it's been, it's been very, a very exciting journey. What I want to start with is a little bit of my own journey. I want to get to meet some of you. I, we won't be able to meet everybody, but I'm going to call on you in a minute or so and ask you to introduce yourself and say one thing you hope for, dream of, something. And then we're going to talk about sources of strength, a little bit about inner wisdom and fear and overcoming that. And that's why you have a piece of paper in front of you. You're going to be writing yourself a um, sources of strength prescription. If we have time, we're going to do a little physical thing. Normally, when I do these workshops and they're a bit longer, I have some art activity that we do, and it's a renewing art activity. But today, we have a briefer amount of time. But how many of you work at UCSD in some capacity? Great. So what I would like to offer is if you have a t after you hear the presentation and if it appeals to you or nourishes you, I would like to offer to various teams across the entire campus, if you would like, uh, like during a staff meeting, to have a one-hour renewal workshop or something like that, I would be honored to do that. And you just have to reach out. I have two emails. One is ebeck at ucsd.edu, and that's because I've been here a long time, so I'm not E12 Beck or E15 Beck. I'm actually, if there was an E1 Beck, that's who I am, because I've been here since 1987. But if um, my other one is light streams, L-I-G-H-T means l Ellen means light, and Beck means a little river or salt, small stream. So my email is light streams, like streams of light, light streams with an S. I, I didn't get to Gmail quick enough to be the first, so now I have more streams. And at gmail.com, at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out if I don't get back to you. Keep emailing till I get back to you because you're helping me with my New Year's resolution of if people feel connected and reach out, that I reach back. So just keep emailing till you get a, re just press send until I reply. And then you're helping me. And I mean that in all sincerity, in all sincerity, because I do a lot of local and state and national work. So, but I want to reach out to our own community because our environment can be so often destructive of the human spirit. So let's just face that together as staff, as junior faculty, as students. We do our darndest to create healthy space and wellness and oasis, but so often 
it can be so destructive? And how can we make a decision together that we are no longer going to accept that? That we are going to find a way to move through that? We need these jobs, and people need these jobs. And, but we, have, we deserve to be treated as human beings and to treat each other as human beings and to learn to be human beings first. That's like, how do we forget? What happened? Aren't we just human beings? Let's be human beings with each other. So my own, and if you have a wonderful setting and what I'm saying is absolutely irrelevant to you, wonderful. Come help other places learn to be oases. But my sadness has been working at UCSD for so many years that I find that it, sometimes that's just not the case. So let's work together to make that transformation occur. And I mean that in all sincerity. I can tell you a story that many, many years ago, it's a funny place to start this talk. You shouldn't be filming because then it'll be public. But many, many years ago, as faculty, when I was having trouble getting promoted, a wonderful dean of academic affairs took me aside. And so help me, this is what he said. It was like many years ago. Now I'm a clinical professor and all this stuff. But then I was having a lot of trouble getting promoted. And he took me aside and he said, Ellen, I don't know if we can fix it, but I've got to tell you the problem. And I want to be honest with you. And you know what he said? He said, it's a diversity issue. And the truth is, you're too different. And so help me, that's what they said. And it was true. I'm passionate. I'm excited. So you know, you learn how to use your own little personal dimmer switches and things like that. And when do you go into a meeting and you say things like, well, it would be nice if, and you really hope somebody else suggests something, and then you can say, let's go for it. And you're kind of sometimes scared because you have this great idea, but you don't know if somebody's going to go, yeah, or if they're really going to be supportive. So how do we, how do we decide? You know, all they talk about climate. How do we decide together that we're going to create healthy pools and not toxic pools? And if we're in a toxic pool, just take your little, like a little amoeba, just take your little pseudopod and go, Ch -ch -ch. I'm going to just go over there. I'm just going to go over there and make my water healthier. So my own journey, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and I, um, I was born, my parents were older when I was born, not so much now, but then. <laughs> um, they were, my father was 53 and my mother was 43 and I was the only child of his third marriage. His two wives had died he'd, and he'd had a son and two daughters from his previous marriages. And when I was about five, the son from my father's second marriage came home to live with us and within a few months he chose to end his life in our house. And then when I was about 10, my half-sister, one of the f two half-sisters from my father's first marriage, when her husband uh, left, she became psychotic, actually. She became schizophrenic. It triggered schizophrenia. And she, um, you know, they s say that that doesn't happen, but actually great stressors can trigger underlying emotional illness, I would say, underlying emotional illness. So what happened is that she became schizophrenic and remained that way all her life. Sort of like the movie A Beautiful Mind, but no Nobel Prize at the end, right? Has anybody seen A Beautiful Mind? And we all know people, if we're really honest, who are in that situation, but no Nobel Prize, just sad situation. So I grew up believing that, that was what, if that's what happened to my brother and sister, that was what would probably would happen to me. And I struggled with unhappiness and um, I liked school, but otherwise I had very little self-esteem. I ended up becoming a physician, and I was in my mid-20s, and I went through a wonderful personal therapeutic process within humanistic psychology that helped me realize no matter what bad thing had happened to me, I could paint the picture of my life. I could hold the paintbrush, and if I could give you a gift, I would give you that paint, I'd paint your own paintbrush to paint the picture of your life wherever you are today. Our life is not only our work, and we all know that, we have so many sources of meaning, children and, and grandchildren and grandparents and art and music, and we have a source of livelihood that we may love, that we may love. But how do we put it all together? How do we create that? So when I was in my mid-20s, I made a decision that that's what I wanted to devote my life to. And my career has been, how do we create environments where we help people take charge of their life and achieve well-being and achieve joy? And how do we do it? Well, the first thing is how we relate to each other, how we communicate with each other. Do we do it with kindness, with respect, with self-awareness of how the impact of what we're saying on the other? 
So I want to take a moment now and meet a few of you. I would act, actually encourage people who don't, it's a difficult challenge, who don't usually speak, who are not usually, I'm here, that's what I used to be like, I'm here, you know, take me. I would just like to ask a few people who don't usually speak first, maybe someone in this section, to just put up your hand and say, my name is, and I work in such and such department, and I dream or a hope that I have is or something I care, I'd love you to talk about, whatever you'd like, or why I came today. Someone in this, say, don't all put your hand up at once. <laughs> Even if you're, yes, thank you. Great, we need you. <laughs> something that's important to you or you hope for? Or... Oh, great, excellent. And what's something you love? that's good for you, that nourishes your spirit? Uh, I love my family, I love music. Okay, what kind of music? Okay, do you listen? Yes. Great. Yes. Do you ever listen in the car? I do. Good, that's a very good place to renew yourself, listening to music in the car. Excellent, thank you. Someone back there. Oh, great, good morning. My name is Sandra Stewart, I work in the gift process. Yes! Hi, thank you for all your help. N faces, and now go with names. Yes. Also name, yes. Yes. Great. Um, we sang together. Great. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful. There's a teaching that once a day, to go, luck, we have the ocean, but you can go to a field or you can just go outside and pour out your heart once a day, to actually speak out your heart. Whatever your faith, whether you're a, a, a different spiritual faith or you're, you see yourself as spiritual, or you see yourself the faith of social justice, which is an equally important faith. However you believe, the idea of once a day finding somewhere to just pour out our heart, to speak it out, to let it come out. And then this teaching, this teaching is to be, do our best to be in joy, to do our best to, even if we feel negative about stuff, to try to find joy or to express it, but once a day to honor that. And one of my patients taught me to um, pour out our heart to whenever a tear comes, that we're touching truth and love. She called it in Spanish, las joyas de amor, that we were touching jewels of love. And if a jewel of love came, let's say when you're at work, or let's say something really frustrating happened, like something happened yesterday in my work that's very frustrating, and you're frustrated or you're hurt or you're angry, or, or with a patient. How many people here work with patients? So when you're working with a patient, Sometimes the tear comes to our eyes, and that to allow it to come and to honor it. Or if we're with, we're seeing our own health professional or somewhere and a tear comes, that we can make it safe. And then you ask the tears to speak. So if you're with somebody you care about and they cry, and they're saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break. Don't say it's not about breaking down. It's about honoring our truth. It means that you created an environment in which that person felt safe enough for those tears to come forth. And when they come forth, let them speak. Let's find out what they have to say. Maybe they say, I'm tired. Maybe they say, I've had it. Maybe they say, I'm scared about my job or I'm scared about my children or something or just I'm weary. Let them speak. And in letting them speak, it's healing. It starts to be healing. So that's part of that pouring out once a day. Someone else, yep, back there. Somebody in front of the uh, camera person, unless a camera person would like to share, but someone back here. Please, don't be afraid. I won't, I won't be scary. We have someone here. Great. I'm Anna Lucia. I'm a graduate student in the biomedical science and graduate program. Great. And cats, okay. Yeah, I, I like cats, I like cats. Singing, so when I turned 50, like the, the Northern Cherokee teach 
that we're not adults until we're 51 because everything we've done until then is preparation. And 51 is you're a junior tribal elder. You're sort of like junior tribal elder in training, like a CIT, like a counselor. In so I'm actually, according to that, I'm 13, and it feels just right. If it felt like I was 70, 64 trying to change the world, I feel like I should have done more by now. 13, I feel just right, just right. And, and it's the next level. It's like, what can I do at the level of community? How do I think a little bit larger? I've reached a place of maybe a little, maybe my physical body is not what I wish it always would be, but my spiritual and emotional body, I've grown. I can handle some stuff that I didn't used to be able to handle before. So it's, it's a growing in wisdom. So um, they say that. So let's think if we're something that we would, so what I did when I turned 50 is actually one of my colleagues here, he's a physician and he actually is from Africa, and, when, and he said, I want to do something for you. And I said, well, 51, he said, he said, well, you're 50, he said, in his country they have womanhood parties. I said, okay, and he gave me a woman, I said, couldn't we call it an adulthood? He said, no, we give womanhood. I said, fine. So at 50 he gave me a, a womanhood party. So I would really encourage you to, you know, reach out, ask. Because nobody, are, people, I have a lot of people in my life who love me and I'm very honored, but nobody makes me parties. So this man made me a womanhood party and it was because I asked, he said, what can I do for you? He said, you know, I haven't had a birthday party in a long time. So I would encourage that. So anyway, I, what I'd like you to do now is take your sheet of paper and I'd like you to write, so put a big RX at the top, you know, prescription, this is a prescription. Rx, R and an X. And under Rx, put your name, your address, your birth date, just, or your social, whatever you want, last word, just so we know it's you. You know it's you. This is only for you. This is not for anyone else. This is only for you. And I'd like you to think of something that over the years you have loved, that has nourished you, that is good for you, and it doesn't have to be even, and this is a secret, it doesn't have to be diet or exercise, although it could be, but it doesn't have to be. It could be singing, it could be prayer, it could be music, it could be walking your dog, it could be your cat, it could be time, phoning your grandchildren. Something that's good for you. And I want you to write it in a way that it's kind of like, even if you haven't been doing it for a long time, because what happens is when we're under great stress, just when we need those things the most is when we've let go of them. And then we wonder why we feel disconnected from our deepest self, our own inner wisdom. And usually there's a part of us that's beating up on us, that's pushing us and driving us. And we'll talk about that part in a moment and how to embrace that part of us. But in the meantime, just something that you love and write it like, realistically, realistically, like maybe once a month go for a hike. And if you wrote it once a week, it won't happen. So, you know, there's, so I don't want you to write something that you're going to then feel bad in a week when you didn't get to do it. I want, even if it's once a year, hike once a year, do you know what I mean? Like write something you love that nourishes you, that is good for you, and write so it might be singing lesson once a week, or it might be walk in the woods once a month, phone grandchildren twice, and you can do more than one, just to have at least one, please. And don't overthink it. Just something you love that's been good for you over the years. Does everybody have a sheet of paper? Oh, here's, we gave them out at the beginning. Here you go, dear. I see somebody looking at me. Sheet of paper, I'll give you two. Anyone else need a sheet of paper? Everybody else have, anybody need a writing instrument? Because we don't write very much anymore. In fact, if you want to do it on your notes section of your phone, I won't argue. Great, all right. Do people have one? All right, is anybody willing to share one? What did you write? You don't have to, yes. Tell us who you are if you don't mind. And where, where are, you, are you at UCSD? Yes, I work in, um, it's known as ITS now, PPACT. 
Great, thank you. So my one thing that nourishes me is exercise. It allows me to sleep better. Good. So is there a particular kind of exercise you like? Walking. Walking. So how often did you say you will walk? Um, I'm saying I should do it. Not should. I will. I'd like to. Oh, I would like to. Yeah. And what's realistic? Three, four times. Right. And what's realistic? Once a week. Okay. So put walk once a week. You see, I don't want you to put shoulds in here. Shoulds we're leaving at the door. I left my shoulds a long time ago. I mean, it's hopeless. Can I share with you what my exercise is? Number one, I love to dance. So dancing is awesome. Don't dance as much as I used to. But I actually really like basketball. So what happened? Yeah, I know, strange, right? So I used to go to the Magic Johnson 24-hour fitness. And I was the oldest, plumpest, whitest woman in the <laughs> basketball court. And honestly, if I happen to have a wonderful husband, partner, I'm very lucky, I'm very grateful, we're still together. We got through the bumps and the lumps, and here we are as friends. It's such an honor. But um, if you ever want to meet somebody, go shoot baskets at the Magic. <laughs> all these men, all these men would come over and say, can I help you with your shot? And I'm going like, oh my god, if something ever happens to my husband, I love my husband. I know where I'm, I know where I'm going. I'm going to the Magic Johnson, and I don't have a, I can't do a three-pointer for beans. I just stand under there and I go, one, two. I put on my music, I swagger a little bit, and it is so much fun. So then this year, my husband actually put up a net in the backyard, because he saw that it was actually, I was doing some exercise. So finding something you love putting on YouTube videos of, um, of uh, Bob Marley. You know, fine, what are, uh, what's, what's that one I love? Hips don't lie, right? I mean, uh, YouTube videos of hips don't lie and just move. Or read a book. How many of you love reading? Me too. When I was a child, that's how I coped. I escaped into other worlds by reading. You too? Do you, want to, do you mind speaking to that? Well, What's your name? Oh, hi. Okay, I'm Susan Levy. Uh -huh. Oh, yay. Great. All the people who help us get money. <laughs> They're all sitting over here. Thank you for all the people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I am going to sing. We're going to sing. So uh, this is a spiritual. This is a spiritual. And if you're not a person of faith, please just join in. And I will teach you the words, OK? The words are, every time I feel the spirit, every time I feel the spirit, I will pray. But if you want to replace pray with the word, I will live. Or, but every time you feel the spirit, OK? It goes like this. Oh, God, I'm doing this. <laughs> Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Down on the mountain my Lord was born. Out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Jordan rivers, chilly and cold, chills the body, but not the soul. Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Now, that is the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> 
because I decided when I was 50 that I was going to learn to sing. And people said, you can't sing. And I said, I know. And, I, and now I'm in this choir. And you know what my goal was? It was that if I ever had a group, because I do a lot of public speaking, I wanted to lead them in a song and not sound unpleasant. <laughs> I never wanted to get to the point of performing. I just wanted to not sound unpleasant. So I need to check. Was I OK? Yeah. All right, cool. We're going to do one more. We're going to do one more. This is from Broadway. This is from Oliver. And this is it, OK? Do you know who will buy from Oliver? Does anybody know that? Oh, let's get, uh, who will, who will buy? How, do you know how to start it? Thank you. Who will buy this wonderful morning? Such a sky you think you see. Who will tie it up with a ribbon and put it in a box for me? So I can see it at my leisure when everything's go wrong. And I can keep it for a treasure to last my whole life long. Who will buy this wonderful feeling? Oh, it's so high, I think it could cry. Me, oh my, I don't want to lose it. So what am I to do? There must be someone who will buy. Wait, 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 don't go. Who are you? Who are you? Isn't that enormous courage? Standing ovation for this woman. That was beyond. Who are you? Tell us. You sat down again. <laughs> My name is Helen Mount. I work over at Muir College in the writing program, and I love to sing. They are so lucky to have you. They are so lucky. Well done. Thank you. That was enormously courageous. Well done. Now, for the people who do other things in singing, can we have a couple of other people who would share a, uh, something you put on your personal um, list? I know. We're going to let it do it until it stops. It's telling me that, oh, you know what, that's so good. That means I still have 20 minutes. That's so exciting. Or 10, or that is so exciting. Oh well, my god, you think you're done. Stop. It won't stop. So we're just going to ask it to be quiet. Don't, OK. <laughs> it wants me to know what time it is. Um, yes, ma'am. What's your name? My name is Oh, fantastic. Edible plants are amazing. Maybe, would we, we, without trying to burden you, without trying to burden you, if you would be willing to create a short list of edible plants and around, just, and you don't have to, you could either share them with Lorraine, who teaches a lot of cooking and natural food, or even with the or conference organizers if they have a list of the emails. But I love edible plants. So you've been looking, learning about edible plants in the area. So, what would be, let's say it's stressful at work for any of you, let's say, so what you need, what's good to do is to put this message either on a card, in your wallet, on your fridge, all over the place, a message for yourself. So yours might be garden or walk or what would your message be? If there was a message that was to you and you saw that, and it nourished you, either an action or a word. Would it be like garden or be with plants, maybe? Yeah, maybe be with plants. Would that be good? That would be good. OK, thank you. So each of you now think of your word message. What is your word message 
that you will see and you decide if you're going to put it on a card, you're going to put it on your fridge, you're going to, I don't know, put it in your pocket. I, um, you know, one of the things that was stressful for me when I was a young doctor, still is sometimes, is that, you know, people in their lives don't fit into 15 minute slots. It's just so unacceptable that that's part of the practice of medicine because it's impossible to be, to build this kind of relationship and be a healer and teacher. So I used to, when I'd have to go from one patient to the next, I'd, when I'd wash my hands, I'd kind of look at myself in the mirror for a second. I'd say, okay, Ellen, we're gonna let go of this past thing. We're gonna move to the future. It was kind of like trying to be in the moment, but it was a way to remind ourselves to be in the moment. Because it's beautiful to think about being in the moment, but sometimes when we're not in the moment, we have to have a message to get us into the moment. So I would say, if there was a word or something, I would say put it around you. Have it be in your environment. And remember that we, I do believe we have control over a couple of moments. This one and the next one. And that's about it. <laughs> so this one and the next one. So how do I want to be in the next moment? Can I stop and listen for a minute? Can I recognize that I'm going through something dif difficult and share with the person beside me? How do I do that? How do we begin to do that process? So there are several other activities we might have done, but I do want to make sure I share the following thing, and then I think we'll try at the end to do a, um, a visualization. So there's a thing called the, uh, I call it, uh, it's called the um, Gandhi, Marley, Rumi, King, Huerta, Hillel, somebody else that I just forgot, uh, rule of life, and I'll just go through it quickly. So Gandhi taught to be the change you wish to see in the world, right? To be the change. But it's not always that easy to be the change, especially when there's a lot of stuff happening. So how do we be the change? Well, the first thing we have to do is what Bob Marley, a famous philosopher and poet, taught. And he taught to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, only that we can free our minds. It's a line in the song, Redemption Song, from Bob Marley, from Reggae, and it's emancipate ourselves from our own mental slavery. I would guarantee that most people here beat up on themselves far too often, or have learned to beat up on themselves less, and that it's been a lifelong journey to let beat up on ourselves less. And often that's because you do a really good job, so you get hired because they know you'll do the job. But martyrs die. Don't be a martyr. They land on crosses. That's why they call them martyrs. We have to learn how to sh give love to that part of ourselves that gets us here and organizes things. But, but, it, but it's not the only part of us. Our, the part of us that pushes and drives and says, next job, next that part is only part of us. Often it feels very alone and it needs to, feels like it needs to run the show, but often it's exhausted too. And if there are deeper selves, the part that loves stuff, the part that wants to make a difference, the part that's a little bit wiser, can say, you know, let me help here. I'm here for you, head. Let me help. And the head gets scared, but if you ask the head what its goal is, it usually will say, I want her to be successful or I want her to be happy. And then you say, but, that, but your mechanism is not working. It's not working to keep hitting me over the head if you really want me to be happy. So then I said, oh really, yeah, you're right. You know, but it doesn't know anything different. It knows that's like Johnny One Note. So our deeper wisdom can help embrace, and also our body. It can say to our body, you don't need to be so weary anymore. You don't, thank you. You don't need to be so weary anymore, body. I can, I'm gonna give you some caring. I'm gonna not see you as a problem. I'm gonna see you as, I would see a friend, like a part of me that I love. And I'm gonna bring you a little bit into sort of a little bit of light. And we're just gonna look at what you need. And if we asked our bodies right now, and our mind, but if we asked our bodies right now, what do we need? And listened, listened with caring and love, looked inside. Just do this for a second. Look inside and smile at yourself and say, thank you, body. Thank you for getting me here. Thank you for keeping walking. Thank you for sitting for hours at that computer. Thank you, body. Even when you're sore, 
Thank you for keeping working. And you could even say, I'm sorry I haven't been there as much as I'd like for you. I try to push you, but I don't always embrace you. Just have a little conversation. Good. And you can have a little conversation with your head, too. You can say, thank you for getting me the job, but now we need to slow down a little. Enough already. Nobody will die if this doesn't happen in the next 47 seconds, even though everybody around me is making it life and death. The good thing when you're a doctor is you realize there's one thing that's life and death. It's actually life and death. And everything else isn't. So when you're a doctor, you know when it's life and death. And just everything, but don't say to anybody at UCSD that I said that because they won't invite me back. It's just, it just isn't. And how, now sometimes there are absolute deadlines and things like that, but why do we even call them deadlines? Why do we call them lifelines? I mean, my God, they're called deadlines for a reason. All right, so Gandhi taught that. So then Marley said, let's emancipate ourselves. Might be at home, might be at work. Then what do you do with that? Well, King taught, well, before King, in order to do emancipate ourselves, we have to deal with fear. And another time we could talk more about fear and how do you overcome it? How do you make it smaller? But Rumi, a famous Sufi Muslim poet, said that not to move the way fear moves us. When we experience fear, to see its message, maybe it has an information for us, make it a little smaller, say, oh, you're kind of like cuter than I thought. You know, but maybe it has a message. Maybe it's fill out these forms or make sure you get to work on time because they're giving you a really hard time or something. But it doesn't have to paralyze us. If we deal with it, if we see it as something we've created and we want it to help us achieve a goal. So Rumi taught, don't move the way here. Now, what do you do with all that? Then you do King. King taught, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So look around in your life, in your personal life, in your work life, in your professional life, in your voting life. Look around and see where you might see injustice, where it's something that you perceive is unjust. And then see if there's something you can do about that, even in a small way. Maybe help a child or your grandchild read or something like that. Some injustice that you see. Decide if you can't do too much of it now, maybe in the future. But match it to something about which you are passionate. So Aristotle and Buning taught that there are certain things about which we are passionate. Think about something you're passionate and match it to that injustice. If you love singing, who, to whom might you sing? Where, and I bet you already do that, but where might you sing where there's injustice, like ageism and elderly people living alone in nursing homes with no incredible human beings who deserve to have meaning and purpose and often are alone. Maybe we reach out to them with art or with song or with voting, writing letters to your congressman or something. Um, but, or, something you're passionate about and matching it to a need. And if you're not in a place in your career right now where you can do that fully, pick a little way, a little way. Then you take all of that, all of that, and you do huerta. And the great thing about it is people used to think that Cesar Chavez said, si se puede, but actually it was a woman, Dolores, Dolores Huerta. And she said, si se puede, yes we can. Because if we believe we can, why be here? Even if we, everything around us says you can't, we might as well live as if we can. Why not? Let's live as if something is possible, so even something small. If there's somebody you like, knock on his or her door and say, hey, let's have coffee. Because if you never talk to them, chances are they don't know you exist. Now, they might say, I don't want to have coffee with you. But if you don't knock on their door, how would they even know you're there? Let's have coffee. So, then you do, what do you do with all that? Well, Hillel, who was a great teacher, he said this. He said, if I'm only for myself, who will be for me? Most of us are very good at advocating for others. If we see someone in trouble, we fight for them, and we help them, and we listen to them. But doing that for ourselves is a huge challenge sometimes. Yes. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? 
So just for a moment, what would it mean to be for yourself? You came here. That was something for yourself. Then he taught, if I am only for myself, what am I? So it means be for others, but I don't have any worry about this group. I believe that everybody in this group in some way is being for others. And then finally he said, if not now, when? So to start small, to pick something, to look at a fear maybe and say, you know what, I will give that a try. The great thing about getting older is you don't have to be good at it, even if you do it. If you'd like to dance, just close your eyes, no one sees you. You dance. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's fine. Life is, why do we have to be so good at things? So I'm going to now finish with something that I'd like you to, I'm going to guide you a little bit into a hopeful future. If I say a word that you don't like, that is not right for you, please replace it with a word that you feel comfortable with. And as I offered, if any of a group of you would like a little workshop with some art or some simple massage, all sorts of things, just reach out to me and we'll see what we can make happen because we are in all of this together. And before I do this last thing, I do want to say to you how much I respect and admire each of you. You need to hear this from me. Many of you are the unsung heroes in this place. And you come in in the morning or early morning, you work incredibly hard, you get the grants out, you get the forms out, you get the everything done. And sometimes I hope it doesn't feel thankless. I hope that there are people saying, well done, good job, thank you. But just for the moment, I want to say thank you. And look at each other for a moment and say thank you. Just whoever you're sitting near, thank you. Thank you for everything you do and all the burdens that you carry. Let's carry them more lightly together. So now close your eyes, sit comfortably, get comfortable, comfort. However your body is comfortable. And I want you to look inside at your body and like we said before, just say good, thanks for being here. Thanks to myself, hi body. And now you're going to move from your body. You're going to move out into the, your family. Your family. And you're just going to see your family, both your family of origin and your family of choice. You're going to see the people who are important to you, maybe from the past, the present, and the future. And you're just going to see them well. You're not making them well. You don't have to do anything. You're just seeing them happy and healthy and well. And I'd like you to put your hands sort of in front of you on your legs, like sort of, if you, sort of opening, and bring in, bring your hands together, bringing into them those people that you love, that which they need. So just have your hands moving together. And now have your hands moving apart, letting go of what they don't need. And have your hands moving together to bring in what your family and the people you love need. It's coming in from the universe, from the ends of the universe. And you are going to let go of what they don't need by letting go of your hands, letting the hands go. Now we're going to move to your workspace in your mind. Just see your workspace, see the people you work with, see some of the ones that you really appreciate and some of the ones that can be a little challenging at times. <laughs> Just see them. Hope and wish for them health, peace, happiness, that which they need. And bring your hands in and see it happening to them, imagining it. They're, in, they're like, you know, like the whole world is in your hands. They're like in your hands. <laughs> And then let your hands go and let go of what they don't need. And now we're going to go to the city, the level of the city, the state. Just bring in what people in California and San Diego need. Understanding, awareness, whatever you need. And let go of health, happiness, strength. And now we're going to move out to the country. Just let people send that which people need. 
and we're gonna move out to the world. We're gonna embrace between our hands the world. And we're gonna just imagine health, peace, happiness, safety, joy, whatever you wanna send to the world. And now we're gonna go beyond the world. We're gonna look down at the world from the sky from the stars. You're up there in the galaxies. You're up there in the Milky Way. You're a star with the other star. And you're looking down and you're just sending to the world that which the world needs. Health and peace, wonder, safety, love. Use your hands to extend it. Let go of what we don't need. And now we're coming back. We're coming back from outside the world to the world itself, to the country, to the city, to our workplace, bringing some healing, to our family of choice and of origin. And now it's to ourselves. So now you'll take your hands and you'll see yourself between your hands. And you are giving that to yourself, which you need. And you are letting go of what you don't need. And you are bringing yourself that which you need. And you are imagining a future, a present and a future for yourself of health, happiness, wisdom, strength, that which is important to you, whatever words you want to use. And now I want you to take both your hands and put them over your heart, one over the other, over your chest, over your heart, and just send to yourself respect, love, understanding, peace, just relax into that moment, just relax into that moment of the simple joy of being alive. And when you're ready, return to this place, breathe, shake your body a little. Thank you.